a workshop. Um, the, uh, well, I think, hold on. Uh, oh, there you go. So um, one of the, the major themes in, in, this, uh, in this workshop is, of course, uh, has been the, the, this idea that, that there exists uh, feedbacks between microbial growth and, uh, and microbial uh, ecological and evolutionary processes. And we've, we've just uh, saw a wonderful uh, example in the talk by, by Kaylin Bethesian about um, how uh, antibiotic production can mediate the uh, assembly of complex um, uh, microbial communities. Uh, Jeff and Jonas also gave some examples uh, related to um, how a microbial growth produces changes on pH, which in turn uh, mediates uh, complex interactions. And um, Pankas talked a little bit yesterday about um, the idea of cross-feeding, the, uh, the production of uh, metabolic byproducts as another mechanism that can generate um, uh, the assembly of complex communities. Um, I wanted to just give you one of my favorite examples, on, uh, experimental examples of, of this. This is a paper by uh, Rosenzweig Adams et al. from about 23 years ago. And um, this experiment uh, was an experimental evolution experiment. They, they started from a, a clonal population of E. coli that they grew on a, on a chemostat under conditions of high glucose concentration. And they evolved this system for uh, a few hundred generations. And uh, a, a really wonderful thing happened, which is that after about uh, 700 generations or so, uh, when the, the, the authors examined um, what the content of, of, of the chemostat, uh, they found that the, the original um, strain that they had started with had diversified into three different strains. One of them had um, a, an enhanced ability to grow on, on glucose. And of course, as when, when E. coli grows on glucose, it produces uh, uh, secondary metabolites, uh, byproducts of glucose metabolism that it secretes to the environment, such as uh, acetate and glycerol. So as E. coli had become better at consuming uh, glucose, it had been also become a stronger secretor of acetate and glycerol. So it had thus transformed the environment, right, from a, from a purely glucose environment into a, a, a much more complex uh, uh, biochemically environment. And uh, those two extra niches, the acetate and the glycerol, had been um, uh, exploited through the evolutionary emergence of um, mutants that um, were specialists in, in, the, in the consumption of those two resources. So um, this is a, an example of how a, a, a multi-species, uh, multi-genotype, if you will, ecosystem can spontaneously assemble from um, even through evolutionary processes in just a few hundred generations. Um, and, and you have uh, through the uh, uh, construction of new niches uh, from the provided uh, one. So all of this experiment um, was done in, in uh, minimal media with a single carbon source. Right? And this is defined medium. So, so because of these and many other experiments, and this is by no means the only one that has seen things like this, um, then that prompted to ask the question of whether uh, complex multi-species communities can, can uh, also be assembled uh, in, in defined media with a single carbon source. And this is um, beyond the fact that I think it's, it's, it's a cool question to ask, and I, I was really curious about it. Um, it it's, it's very useful because um, this, if, this is, uh, if we can accomplish this, uh, we could use such ecosystems to, uh, as, as essentially as in vitro model systems to investigate microbial community assembly. Now, as, as every other community assembly process, microbial community assembly is, is very complex in nature. Um, you can think, for instance, on, on the question of, of why do different hosts um, uh, or different people have, harbor different microbiomes. And the, the, the overall, the number of reasons why, why that is, is, is very complex, right? Uh, we're all different genetically. We have different lifestyles, different diets. Um, and, and that produces, of course, environmental filtering, right? We might be selecting for specific taxa uh, differently from, from person to person. Uh, on, on top of that, you know, I, uh, we all live in different places. You know, uh, there's, there's a very international audience. There's people living, coming here from Pakistan, from Israel, Italy. I live in Connecticut. Um, and, 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 and we all are exposed to different, to different uh, uh, microbial taxa, right? I, I cannot have on me microbes that are not in the, in the immediate environment, so they cannot in, invade me, right? Um, and, and, and on top of that, there's all, of other processes. There's the historical contingency, which at the end of the day, it's a combination of, of uh, the stochastic timing of arrival 
of, of colonizers and invaders and the population dynamics between them that can also generate uh, diversity. And uh, you also, of course, have random sampling from the environment. You can have transient microbes that, that are present in, in, on us just for a short period of time, and they will, they will be flushed away over time. So uh, as you see, that there, there, there's a wide range of processes that can lead to community assembly in nature. And not, not only that, they all happen at the same time. right? And, and, and this is not an exhaustive list. You can, I'm sure you can think of others. Um, so the, the question then is, uh, if, if, if we're able to have a, a, a model community that uh, where we can study the assembly of, of, of complex communities with many, many species, uh, we might be able to disentangle all of, this, um, all of these uh, different factors and, uh, and study them one at a time. To give you a, a few examples of what kinds of things I, I was hoping we could do, uh, I was telling you that in, that in nature, uh, the um, uh, different uh, habitats, uh, and not only this is true for, for host-associated communities and any kind of ecological setting, you'll have microbial uh, communities that can be different from, from habitat to habitat. And in nature, uh, the, the, the uh, habitats are highly heterogeneous, and they're biochemically diverse, and, um, and, 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 and that is really hard to control. Right? Um, in, in contrast, if we were able to have a, a, a communities growing under well-defined media, we can absolutely control what goes in there. Right? Uh, we, can, we can define uh, every nutrient that we add, and, and, and that will allow us to also connect uh, whatever population biology we end up discovering with the metabolic processes that, uh, that we can uh, infer based on, on, on the metagenome of the community, right? That will allow us to connect metabolism with, with population dynamics in a, in a very, very uh, uh, concrete uh, way right? and, and, and precise. But there's, there's other uh, benefits of having um, basically experimental community assembly in vitro, uh, which of course uh, is, for instance, the, the access to the regional pool of species in nature uh, you, the communities get uh, not necessarily are all um, invaded by the same uh, regional pool of species. In vitro, we can control uh, what pool of species invade which other, which, um, which environments. We can create uh, absolutely identical environments, and we can invade them all with the same, from the same regional pool of species. And, and we can do this in very high throughput, right? So, so we can get statistics on, on, on the community assembly process that would be very hard to do uh, in, under natural conditions. Um, we can also control the timing of those invasions uh, and uh, in a way that, again, is very hard to, to control in, in natural settings. So uh, I'm just giving you a kind of a laundry list of, of, of why it is that I'm interested in this question, uh, and I hope I'm convincing you that it's, it's worth at least pursuing. So, um, so the, the, the question, again, is uh, can, in principle, complex uh, communities with, and by complex, I mean, Jeff, for instance, was discussing yesterday communities that are maybe N larger than one, um, two, three species. Now I'm thinking of you know, as complex a, a, as possible, right? Like, like how, how many species can you fit uh, on, on a single carbon source, right? And minimal media, nothing else, right? So, uh, and, 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 and that's kind of what we're after. Uh, our approach um, is, uh, is, is really rather simple. And uh, it consists in the following. We, we uh, collect uh, environmental samples. Uh, we can, uh, we've done all kinds of things, uh, mainly soil bacteria or, or, or aquatic environmental uh, communities. And, and what we do is we take, for instance, a, a leaf sample. We collect it from a pond near our university. Uh, and then we stick that into, um, into essentially water with a few salts, incubate a couple of days. Uh, with uh, some chemicals to inhibit the growth of uh, fungi and nematodes and other eukaryotes. And at the end of the day, when they, uh, after, after one day of incubation, what we do is filter all of the larger particles, and we're left with uh, the bacteria. And so essentially, we end up with a bag of bacteria right? uh, that came from a natural community. And what we then do with that bag of bacteria is that we, we take it and we um, um, now grow it in, in batch culture uh, mode. Essentially, what this means is that we put it in in minimal media with a single carbon source, grow for 48 hours, then take uh, one hundredth uh, of, of that community and transfer it to um, a, a brand new, basically, uh, reactor with, with fresh media uh, of the same kind, right? And we keep doing that for, for many, many generations, right? So it's basically growth dilution, growth dilution, and, and we keep repeating that for anything between, it's every, we do this every, 20, every 48 hours, we've done this for anything between uh, two weeks and a month, right? So anything in the, in, in the order of roughly 80-something to 150-ish generations. After that, uh, and uh, well, we, we, this is bacteria then, so we can freeze our communities every day, right? That's very convenient. Uh, and, but, and, and at the end, and, and as well as at different time points, uh, we uh, establish which members of the community are present 
by uh, Illumina sequencing. We do 16 sequencing. We now we're about to start doing metagenomics, but we haven't uh, done it yet. Uh, and uh, we have done this now for um, a really large number of samples, uh, both in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Uh, these experiments have been running for um, uh, several years at this point. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on, 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 on the work that has been done in, since I moved to Yale by, uh, by my lab members. So, so these are mainly communities from, from different locations in Connecticut. All of the results I'm going to tell you are perfectly consistent with our exper the experiments I did before joining uh, Yale uh, in, in a different lab with different water and, 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 and different uh, person doing the experiment. All of these things actually end up mattering more than probably uh, you may think. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy that, that to say that everything you're going to hear today has been replicated in two different labs. Okay, so um, that's that's kind of that's kind of nice. So we collected samples from, uh, in this case, 12 different uh, locations. These are uh, both uh, more kind of built environment uh, and soil communities, pond communities, um, etc. And yes. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we did, we did sequence these two, right? We, we sequenced the original communities, we sequenced the final two, right? And, 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 and everything in between. Um, the, these communities are, are very highly diverse. We're talking about hundreds to thousands of, of taxa at a relatively shallow sequencing depth, right? So, so these are incredibly diverse, yeah. So we, we're, we tried uh, all those 12 communities on, on a single carbon source. And what was that carbon source? We, we've tried. Uh, a lot of them, uh, and I'm going to focus in here on the ones that we tried at Yale. Uh, at Harvard, we tried 60 of them, uh, but at Yale, we focused on seven of them. Uh, one is glucose, and the other, we took like three carboxylic acids and three uh, amino acids. Uh, but we've tried all kinds of weird stuff, right? and, and, and again, uh, we get uh, relatively uh, interesting results um, too with other, other, other types of uh, carbon sources. So uh, in summary, this is like 12 uh, different environmental samples uh, that are reared on a single carbon source. That's essentially one of the seven that you see over here. Um, and uh, we, we grow in batch culture mode for about, in, in this experiment I'm about to tell you about is, is 80 generations, um, and we keep sequencing as we go, okay? So that's the experiment. So the question is, uh, if you do that, right, if you take a natural community and you force it to grow on, on defined media with a single carbon source, do you end up with a, a community that's still a complex community, multi-species communities interacting with each other? And the, the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, we, we see this. Uh, it's completely generic. It doesn't matter what the carbon source is. It doesn't matter what the initial inoculum is. Uh, we always see uh, a large number of coexisting species uh, in, in every single experiment we've ever, ever done. Right? Um, and th these are the 12 different inocula, the, the seven different carbon sources. The diversity uh, is, uh, depends uh, substantially on what type of carbon source you, you, you use. Uh, but we've seen anything from three to several dozen uh, species. And again, and, and not, not, we're not even sampling all that hard. Right? We're, we're sequencing about 100,000 cells out of a population of close to 10 to the 9. Right, so, um, so there's th certainly more than this, right? but this is what we're, we're seeing. The communities are stable, right? So uh, this is uh, uh, time courses. This is the, the, the fraction of the various species. These are three different glucose communities, um, and uh, the frequencies of uh, uh, stabilize uh, around day uh, generation 50 or thereabouts. Uh, we see this consistently. We have some communities that are still not quite uh, maybe have some transient stuff going on, but for the most part, we see communities that are stable, and not only in, in, in composition, but also in other properties. We measure the OD, the optical density, the number of cells that, again, stabilizes after about 50 generations, and, uh, and, uh, and the richness and other, other, other properties of the, of the communities themselves are, are stable. So uh, communities are complex and, and stably uh, growing together. So um, I, I was telling you uh, at the beginning of this talk that, um, that our, our, our way of thinking is that if cross-feeding can lead to the spontaneous emergence through evolutionary processes of, of a community from a single isolate, right, uh, maybe cross-feeding could also uh, be able to support large ensembles of species coexisting together on, on a single carbon source. Uh, so we wanted to see it actually if the reason why we see in this coexistence is, is cross-feeding. There could be many other, other mechanisms that can help too, right? And uh, we're not ruling any, anything out. Uh, we've done controls to, uh, for uh, temporal and spatial niches. 
I have found very little evidence for either of them. Uh, but of course, we haven't tried all of them. We have about 1,000 communities in our freezer. We haven't tried for all of them. Uh, but we've, put, we've zoomed into one of them, um, which is uh, one of these communities that we have uh, grown in, in glucose. And uh, th this is our, our representative community because uh, it, it's a relatively simple one, and, and we could isolate every member of the community. Um, it, it's represented by about five different taxa, and we isolated all of them uh, by plating. Uh, we, we collected the colonies. And uh, what we're doing is we're, we're taking um, all of these um, different uh, uh, members of the community, which we isolated them, and uh, we, we grow them for 48 hours on glucose as the only carbon source. And after that period of 20, uh, 48 hours, we take uh, the supernatant, uh, basically all of the molecules that, that the microbes have uh, secreted over that, over that period of time, and we use that as the only carbon source uh, on which we're going to grow every other member of the community, right? So we take, uh, we isolate all the, all the mem members of this community. We, all of them actually grow in glucose. That's the first a bit of information that's, that's useful to know. Uh, so all of them can grow fairly well in, in glucose. Uh, and th they also all secrete uh, molecules that, in principle, we wanted to know if they can, those, those extracellular molecules that they have secreted could uh, provide the basis, the carbon source for every other member of the community, okay? It's actually Yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, to the level we could detect with that, which is like pretty, pretty fine, right? So, so yeah, so glucose was pretty much gone after 48 hours, okay? Um, and, um, and this is an example uh, of, of, the, of, of the type of, of, of data we, we generated here. Uh, the uh, emitter uh, uh, is Enterobacter. We, we're taking the, the molecules that Enterobacter secretes. We're feeding them to Pseudomonas. There's no other carbon source here, only that. And, and these are the growth curves. In gray, that's Pseudomonas growing in glucose, 0.2% uh, glucose, which is the, the concentration we use. And in black, those are multiple replicates of Pseudomonas growing on Enterobacter secretions. So as you see, the growth is fairly strong, right? So it's not only that it grows meekly, but it, it, it's, it's comparable to growth in glucose, and, and in fact, it's faster, right, um, that, than that. It, it, it's less efficient, uh, the, the, the final, the carrying capacity is lower, so it's not, not all that surprising, uh, but the growth is very strong, right? And we have, repeat, we repeat that experiment for every possible pair that we could uh, have in our, in our, in our communities. Um, and we, we end up, uh, this is a bit of a mess, so let, let me walk you through it. Uh, every node here, uh, these four nodes are, are, are four members of the community. Uh, here is glucose, and these arrows pointing from glucose to each of the, other mem of each of the members of the community reflect the fact that all of those members can, can utilize glucose as the only carbon source. And as you see, this is a fully connected network, and what this means is that the supernatants of every member of the community can support the growth of every other member of the community, right? So this is a completely degenerate uh, and, 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 and full network, right? Everybody's cross-feeding everyone else, right? And uh, I, I decided not to include this data because the, the, the talk is too long already, but we see like even multiple um, dioxic shifts, meaning that there's not just one thing that every member of the community is cross-feeding uh, every other member. Oftentimes there's multiple things that, that the, the, each other, yeah, are utilizing. No, we don't, yeah, yeah. This is, well, I mean, this is phosphate buffer, so some, there's some, I mean, some degree of that, but we don't have trees, we don't have, you know, any, 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 actual, any actual buffer on it, right? So, so, so I, I wouldn't expect the pH to, to remain uh, constant during the experiment, yeah. Yes? That's right, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't know exactly what's going on, and, and because it's true, I mean, they, they level off, right, after, after 48 hours, but then when you take that supernatant and dilute it with M9, then they keep growing again, right? So um, we don't know what it is, and, and, and it has been suggested to us it actually could be pH, that, um, that, that is being, as you replenish the, the M9, you cannot bring the pH back up, and that allows them to keep growing, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that, that indicates that growth is not perfectly efficient, right? That the microbes have some growth capabilities still on the, on, the, on the molecules they secrete, but they don't complete it for some reason, right? And we still don't know what it is. Yeah. No, we haven't. No, no, we, we haven't yet. We haven't done it yet. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry? Oh, so, so 
Um, it, it could be cell lysis, it could be the, the, the molecules they secreted, right? I mean, we, we're filtering the supernatant through a um, you know, 0.2 micron um, filter. So uh, if, if the cell has lysed and there's like contents that are smaller than that, they, they could be there. Um, but we, we're, we're not controlling for that at this point, right? No, we haven't, we, we don't know, that's a really good question and, and we get that a lot. Uh, we haven't done any analysis of, of the virome of these communities, but they may very well have viruses here. They, they might have phages, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. No, we haven't done it, no. So th those are all things that are on the pipeline, yeah. Uh, that we have like uh, right now two new postdocs that are working on, that are very interested in that question. In fact, yeah. so um, all right. So so this is this is this is it. I mean, I, I'm I'm not claiming that I know w exactly what's going on. All, all I'm telling you is that if you take the supernatants of each other, uh, they can crossfeed uh, like, and it's perfectly well connected, right? So at least this is suggesting that that crossfeeding plays a role. Whether that crossfeeding is comes from the cells bursting out, either because of cell death or or, or a phage. Uh, or, or, or any other reasons we really don't know at this point, right? But what's very clear right, is if you take the, um, the, the, the non-glucose carbon that's present in the media that has been produced by the cells, right, and you feed it to each other, um, they, they all can grow on each other's secretions, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I'm having a lot of trouble understanding. Sure, yeah, yeah, there, there could be all kinds of things, right? I mean, I, we, we don't know what, what's there. Right? There could be amino acids, there could be, uh, yeah, we have no idea what's in the media. Yeah, we haven't analyzed it. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, the, the, the question that we, we started with is whether we can assemble complex communities, and by complex I mean large N, and you know, we're finding anything from two to, several dozens, and again, we're not sampling everything there. So the answer is yes, we can, right? We, we can do it um, in, a, in, a, in a minimal media, well-defined environment. The environment becomes, as you guys are guessing, not as well-defined <laughs> as the microbes grow on it, um, and, and, and that's a fair point, right? But, but at least, uh, and we, we have some evidence that actually the type of carbon source you add has, has a major importance in what type of community you make in the end, um, and, and, and that at least is, is reassuring. So. Um, we, we do find complex multispecies communities forming and cross-feeding cross is, is widespread and promiscuous. So uh, we get to actually what, what, the, what I really want to do with all of this, which is try to understand uh, community assembly using this, uh, these communities. And, and can, can we use them to derive any rules of assembly um, that, um, that are governing uh, the assembly process? So um, for, for that, we focused on, on one of these, uh, on, on, we took all of these 12 communities and, and, and looked at uh, the assembly uh, on, on glucose, we looked at the community structures that formed after 80, 85 generations or so on, on glucose. We looked at, okay, okay, so we know it's a complex community, but what is the community, right? Who, who are there? So um, if you um, look at it at the, uh, at the level of uh, sequence variants, which you can take as a proxy for species, if you will, so these are unique uh, 16S sequences that we, that we find um, in our sequencing, uh, what you see is that each inocula uh, basically, each starting community gives rise to a different uh, stabilized community in glucose. And so we take all of those 12 environmental samples, propagate them in, in glucose for 85 generations, and look at what's there in the end, and perhaps not surprisingly, we see that they're different, right? Uh, that you have different taxa. However, if you look at this at the family level, they're all absolutely identical, right? Like, they, they, they all have the same family level structure. Uh, it's about 70% plus minus 10, uh, 15, if you will, um, uh, of, uh, of enterobacteriaceae, and 15% plus minus something uh, 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 pseudomonas, right? And there's all, uh, a bunch of other taxa uh, that are low, low abundance that, that, are, that are also consistently found in all the communities, right? So what this suggests is that if you, uh, if you can look at this as, as if there were like a family level attractor, right, on, on these communities. And um, you can visualize this by, by plotting um, on, 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 the, on the left side, this is the community structure before, at time zero, right? Before we transferred, uh, the, we propagated the communities. 
And uh, we're, we're, and this is a low dimensional representation, of course, uh, and on this uh, uh, simplex, on, uh, this edge represents center of activacy, this edge is pseudomonadacy, and all of the other families are, are condensed into a single, um, basically, a dimension. And as you see, the, the starting points in, in the simplex are, are very diverse for all 12 communities, right? Some have very little so, uh, enterobacteriaceae and pseudomonadaceae, others have more. But after 84 generations, they're all here. So, um, have you tried to... That's an excellent point. We, we haven't. Yeah, we've have actually been thinking about it, but haven't done it yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm, that's a very good point. Yeah, no, we, we thought about that, and, and uh, we, we're now st starting to experiment. We have migration, even from the original pool, uh, and, and connect them. We have, you know, all, all, uh, we, we have everything to do that experiment, so. There's a body of ecological theory, correct? Please. So, um, so we see this, this attractor here in, the, in, in, in glucose, and we, and we wonder whether the, the attractors in other carbon sources are any different. And, uh, and, and two, two good news, there's still attractors for the carbon sources. This is not some freak accident of glucose, um, uh, but, but they're different, right? So uh, these are 96, the, the red are 96 uh, glucose communities uh, that all converged after 24 or 84 days to the same region in the simplex. The blue are citrate communities that after, four, again, same number of generations have converged to a slightly different place. And in green, you have leucine. Leucine communities are very different. From, from glucose. Um, I'm not going to talk about it either, but we've done uh, metagenomic uh, analysis through by, by infer, inferring the metagenome from 16S, and uh, we find very, very strong evidence that the, the type of, that um, essentially metabolic demands imposed by the carbon source we add uh, is, is critical in order to determine community structure. For instance, uh, uh, the, uh, the glucose communities are, are heavily enriched on PTS transporters, which are uh, essentially, glucose transporters into the cell that are very efficient and which are very uh, present in Enterobacteriaceae. Whereas um, the, the, the leucine communities, uh, all of those members are enriched on leucine degradation pathways. I mean, perhaps not surprising. Um, but, but so, so we, we see that, that that's actually uh, very important. Uh, on the other hand, if you plot the same, if you plot the same data on, on the same simplex but now color by the uh, community of, of precedence, you see that there's not much going so not, not much going on, right? Um, this, this again it, uh, points to the, to the um, metabolic constraints imposed by the carbon source that you're feeding them rather than the community of origin as what determines what is the final structure of, of our communities. So um, the, the question I asked is, uh, are, are there rules that govern community um, uh, assembly? And what we're finding is that there are attractors at the family level. I mean, you can predict what, what's going to be the structure of your community if you take some random soil sample and put it in, uh, in, in glucose media. Um, and I, I, you know what's going to happen in the end, right? It's going to be interbacteriaceae and pseudomonadaceae. And even the ratios are quantitatively very well conserved, right? And, and so we, we actually have repeated this experiment in a different lab. Uh, different with soil samples from like another state, we get the same thing, right? Uh, so that's what I was saying in the beginning. Th this is these results are very robust. Yes. more? Well, the, uh, that's an excellent question. And, and to me, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is because if, if I know what I'm putting in, now I can build up, right? I can, I can go from one and I can keep adding carbon sources. And one very simple question is, as you add more and more carbon sources, do you get more and more diversity, right? Or, or, oh, you mean at the strain level? Um, that, that is a good question too. We're, we're doing meta, actual metagenomics now, so we'll find out, right? And, and, and maybe we can get back to that in a, in a minute or two, because uh, I'll show you some data about, about that, about the strain level. Yeah, the, the, so families, um, the, so the, the, the core um, 
core, metabolic, uh, core metabolism of, at the family level are very conserved. There's all the accessory metabolism that, that is different from strain to strain. Uh, it seems like it's this core metabolism that, that, that's driving this, um, given the, what we see at the family level. Uh, but, but, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. So, okay, so we see uh, these family level attractors, but we also see this large variability at the species level, right? So, um, so we wanted to understand the, the origin of this variability, right? And, and there, there's essentially two different processes that could lead to uh, this, uh, when you do these experiments with 12 different uh, starting points, that you get the same family structure but different taxa, right? And one is that, uh, that um, the representatives of each family on different uh, environmental locations could be different, right? And again, you cannot have in your final community what you did not have at time zero because there's no more migration. So, um, so that could be one explanation. But there's another one uh, that I like better because I, that's kind of stuff I like, uh, and, and which is that there could be a combination of stochastic sampling and micro micro interactions that through historical contingency can also give rise to alternative stable states, right? So we wanted to see uh, which one of these two uh, was explaining uh, the diversity that we're seeing. Um, and in order to do that, we, we selected just one of these communities and, and for now one of the carbon sources, glucose. And uh, what we did is, uh, and again, because we, ha we have this degree of control over the system, we started eight replicate populations from the same pool of species, right? So now you're, there's no variability on the regional pool. There's all the same regional pool. And from the same regional pool, we're inoculating eight tubes. Now, those eight tubes are absolutely identical to one another. They're in the same media, and they're inoculated from the same regional pool of species. Now, of course, right, even if you inoculate from the reg same regional pool of species, there's some stochasticity in sampling, right? Uh, that's unavoidable. And, and, and if you think of the large diversity and the fact that, that the system is very rare, rarefied at time zero, there could be some differences uh, in community to, from community to community uh, when you do that, right? Um, so we wanted to know if, if you do an experiment like this, what are you going to see? Right now, you eliminated variability in the regional pool of species. Do you still get variability at the species level? And uh, the first thing we looked at is family level distribution. Again, no surprise. We get the same thing we've seen before. 70% Pseudomonas, more or less. 30, I'm sorry, Enterobacteriaceae and, and, and Pseudomonas is, about, is the rest, right? No surprises here. So now let's look at the, uh, uh, let's start zooming in. And now let's look at the genus level. So when you do that, we see that uh, three out of eight communities uh, when you look at who makes the uh, Enterobacteriaceae slot, that's made up entirely by Klebsiella, right? That's a, that's a, that's a low diversity um, uh, uh, Enterobacteriaceae slot, if you will. The other five um, are uh, made up of um, an alternative community state made up by uh, a coexisting guild of three uh, Enterobacteriaceae. These three, and, and the reason why we chose this, this particular system is because those are the same that we had isolated before that I told you they cross feed one another. Those are the three guys, right? So th that's why the reason why we chose this particular um, community to the experiment. Uh, but as you see, that, that it's, it's not unavoidable that you starting, starting the experiment, you would have landed here. We might have just as well landed here. And just by chance, we ended up with that community, right? So um, if you zoom in even more, and right, you look now at, uh, at, the, at the sequence variant, uh, you see that all of the, 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 um, the gray bars correspond to Pseudomonas, uh, as the genus Pseudomonas. But if you look at the sequence variants, you see that actually it's different strains of pseudomonas that, that are present on each one of these communities. Yes? This is 16S, yeah. There's no bacillus. We don't add the, the, the vitamins and the, 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 the other metals that bacillus normally need to grow, yeah. So, um, so what we see here is that the, the community is very predictable at the family level. It starts being, uh, seems like by stable at the, at the genus level, and it becomes a mess at the, at the species level. But this is all starting from the same regional pool, right? So um, when, when it came to this question that we were asking before, um, that is, does this variability reflect uh, simple, the fact that different, uh, that when we did this first experiment, each of these tubes were inoculated from different regional pools of species, or whether it um, results from a combination of stochastic sampling and population dynamics, once we eliminate this, this, this first component, this variability, we still see alternative stable states uh, emerging from the same regional pool of species. So it suggests that it's a combination of stochastic sampling and population dynamics, and we're looking into this now. Um, uh, these are the, the temporal dynamics of, of, of one, com one representative uh, community uh, that assembled into, into a low diversity state. Now, so, sorry about the colors. 
Uh, they're sweets now. The blue means Pseudomonas, I'm sorry, um, um, Klebsiella, right, which is this, this guy over here. So it's this community over here. Um, and this is the other one that's more diverse that contains this, this guild of enterobacteriaceae that, that coexist with one another. So uh, what, the, what you see is that, of course, at time zero, they're both identical. But then the, the divergence between the two starts at day one, right? So the, even at day one, um, the, whether or not you have Klebsiella on day one determines whether you're going to end up in this state or that state over here. And uh, the, the, the emergence, uh, what, what seems to be happening is that Klebsiella inhibits the, or, or com outcompetes uh, the other interactiraceae, so that, um, you know, what the, this blue, um, this purple um, um, species here, that's Raul Tela, this yellow one is Citrobacter. As you see, they, they kind of emerge uh, to dominance after um, five time transfers. And, but if you had Klebsiella there, that will never happen, right? And, and the other taxa that you had here, which is uh, Enterobacter, gets outcompeted by Klebsiella, right? So some, um, something happens from day zero to day one that sets the community into one course of another, right? And uh, we now have done uh, some invasion experiments. We've taken the two communities and invaded them against each other. So when you take this community uh, at the final day and invade this community on the final day, uh, this community takes over that, right? So the Klebsiella outcompetes the, the, the Interbacteria, uh, the Interbacteria AC guild. And uh, in fact, even the Pseudomonas that it has also carries over with it, right? So this suggests that the reason why we see these alternative stable states is not that they're actually uh, mutually non-invasive or, or, or what you would call true by stability, but it's, it's probably the loss of Klebsiella, stochastic loss of Klebsiella on, on the early day, on the first day of the experiment that leads to the, uh, to the um, assembly of this alternative state. Um, we don't know exactly why that loss is because Klebsiella is not that, it's, it's fairly abundant in the, in the original community. So we don't know if it is Klebsiella or, or if there's some other species that gets uh, co-inoculated with it that inhibits it and doesn't allow it to grow and paving the way for the other alternative community to form, right? And, and those are experiments that are ongoing right now um, and we're trying to find out. So um, I show you this data um, showing that there, there are alternative stable states and, and we see that in, in, in most, I think it's uh, eight out of the 12 um, communities we see the formation of alternative, alternative stable states, but um, in, in, not, in, not in every uh, uh, soil sample we see alternative stable states. And in fact, uh, let me show you the data for one of them, uh, just to, to show off because the data is so good. I mean, this is all the, not done by me, so I can, I, I'm, I'm free to say it, um, but the data looks really nice. And, and you can see how deterministic and reproducible the population dynamics are, right? To the point where um, this is for one of the communities that assembles into a single, um, uh, into the same um, final uh, state, right? There's no bistability here. But even, even the temporal dynamics are incredibly reproducible uh, across replicates. Uh, in, that my favorite thing is this, there's these outbursts of, uh, of Pantoea that um, comes and goes in, in generation, uh, whatever, in, in, in the fourth transfer, it rises in prominence and then it goes away. And it happens at the same time in all communities, right? So, so this at least gives you the idea that, that population dynamics in these communities is deterministic, um, and uh, even if there's some stochastic sample at the beginning, uh, but, but, and, and, and also that it's, it's very highly reproducible, right? Um, or at least it's, it's not, this is not just experimental error we have, right? This is um, uh, the, the, the joys of working with such talented experimentalists in my lab. I'm, I'm done. Uh, the, 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 this is pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, the the, the take-home message is that we, we can, in fact, assemble complex multi-species community. By complex, I mean N close to 50 or 60, right? Even in, in, depending what the carbon source is. Uh, and, 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 and probably larger, it's just we don't, we're not sampling hard enough um, in a single carbon source. Uh, I think this gives us a very nice model system to investigate community assembly and to, to test a lot of theories about, about community assembly on a, on a semi-realistic situation where we have like large numbers of species. Um, we, we find evidence that cross-feeding plays a major role in, in, in sustaining coexistence. Um, and, uh, and we are finding that, that there are, uh, co that the community assembly, the, the structure of the final communities can be actually predicted, right? And, and at the family level, it obeys uh, rules. It, 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 uh, it, it adopts a specific states that are governed by the type of carbon source that you're adding. And, and, and it's very, very highly reproducible. So um, I just wanted to, uh, to plug in uh, the posters from my two, uh, the two postdocs in my lab. Nancy is presenting one where these family rules that we're deriving, we're now applying them to the idea of microbial community coalescence. 
I said, if you now take two communities that have been stabilized in, 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 a, in, in the same carbon source and you merge them one to one, this is a process, by the way, that in microbes happens all the time, right? Whenever you eat, uh, you know, whatever, a, a, a pineapple or, 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 a, or an apple or whatever, it's a piece of fruit, right? Whatever microbiome was in that piece of fruit simultaneously invades your mouth, right? And this is something that's very, I think, rather unique for microbial uh, invasions. I'm, I'm sure it happens in other types of, of systems too, but it's, it's certainly very much the case in microbial uh, ecosystems that invasions happen uh, community to community. So uh, Nancy has been uh, coalescing these communities and, uh, and she's been able to predict what the outcome of these communities are through uh, applying the rules of assembly that we have derived uh, from, from, from this type of data. Uh, another postdoc, George, has been looking at now the, the evolutionary implications of this feedback between microbial growth and the environment. He's been doing uh, simulations and soon experiments on, um, on what uh, the consequences of, of these feedbacks between and cross-feeding cross uh, has on, uh, on fit, fit, adaptive fitness landscapes and uh, to find this uh, gene by environment by gene interactions and, and the fact that it has on epistasis is very cool stuff. So uh, if you're interested, please go talk to him. Uh, I've been incredibly, incredibly lucky to work with these guys. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, and, uh, um, and both George and Nancy are here. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, a new postdocs, Sylvia Estrella, incredibly talented too, who's in New Haven now. Um, and, and this wonderful grad student who has joined the lab in the past year. And uh, also wanted to, of course, thanks Daniel and, and Pankaj, who are just these wonderful collaborators, such nice people and fun and interesting. And uh, our, uh, this, this guy, Josh Golford, he's the, uh, the, the first author of, all, of this first paper, just an absolutely amazing guy. Uh, and, and also Michael Tikhonov. This, this has really been uh, a lot of fun working with these people. And uh, we get uh, money from Simons and HFSP have made it all possible. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any more questions.